welcome to this session. We got uh, almost 30 people eager to talk to you and hear from you. Uh, so we're just going to get rolling right away here and let's start with uh, Aaron Harris, please. And uh, uh, Fago, you'll be next. Thanks for your time, coach. Uh, having played in the American Football League, was there one particular moment at what, in which you felt that the league was really gaining momentum and sort of changing the opinion that the NFL had of it? Yeah, that happened about uh, the, um, after we had established ourselves a little better after the first, about the middle of the, uh, that 10 year period, maybe years uh, four and five, when we were really starting to play well and we were organized better and the, the uh, there was, you know, we were being paid better and uh, we didn't have to wait in the bank to have our cash, our checks cashed. <laughs> and it was, uh, we were more solid as a league and uh, we started feeling pretty good about ourselves. Yeah, no, no question about it, yeah. Thank you and congrats. Fago and then Josh Dubow next. Hey, how you doing coach? Good, I'm doing great. Um, what words of wisdom could you give anybody that feels doubtful about taking that leap of faith and going after their dreams? Well, I, there's not much you can, I don't think you can, uh, they've got to believe it. They've got to be strong. They got to believe it in what they, what they really want. And I think it's within reach and, and then go for it. I mean, I don't know if there's any, any words that you can put into it other than, Give it your best shot. You, you know, we have, you know, we only live once, and and uh, I, I was fortunate. I have, I had three shots at it, and uh, on the third shot, I said, "Well, this new league is starting up, and and uh, maybe I'll give it one more chance." I don't, I don't owe anybody any money. I, I, I could work the rest of my life, and that was, that was sixty-one years ago, <laughs> and I'm still at it. <laughs> Thank you, Coach. You bet. Josh, and then Mark Holmes. And Tom, congratulations. Just what what was it like for you as a co coaching for Al Davis? What, what was that? What, what was that? Like? What were the the challenges of that? What were the the good parts about that? Just it was obviously a complicated person to coach. Oh, for. memorable! Uh, it was it was uh, arduous. Uh, it was a uh, it was an incredible journey with Al. I started out with him when he first came into the American Football League, Football League as a uh, general manager and coach with the Raiders. Uh, he had been with the Chargers for a couple of years and that's when I first met him and I was with him and watched him grow uh, from uh, assistant coach uh, to a head coach, to a league commissioner, back as an owner and, uh, and, and to an incredible career. Uh, but he was tough. He was demanding. Uh, he was fearless. And, uh, you, but you had to get, you had to know him and I got to know him pretty well. And once you knew him, uh, you knew his stuff, his good things and his bad things. And he had so many good things to, to offer. Thanks coach. Uh, Mark Holmes and then Ed Granny. Uh, congratulations, Coach Mark Holmes from uh, Joe Blue Sports Report. Um, congratulations on being in the Hall of Fame and now being distinctive of a uh, person that only, excuse me, uh, being one of two people that have been a player, uh, assistant coach, a head coach, and now a Hall of Famer, you and Mike Ditka being those two, as well as being the first uh, Mexican-American player in the NFL. Did that put any added pressure on you personally and one other final thing, after taking over for John Madden, who was a very in-your-face coach, um, your demeanor seemed much more quieter and calmer. Was that really the case, or was that just for the public eye? Well, first of all, to answer your second question, uh, that's what I am. I am what I am. Uh, um, that way, as a player, as a person, I, I was, uh, you know, quiet and uh, can, under control. John was that way as a person himself. So he, he took on the field what he was. I took on the field what I was. And I remember talking to Al Davis. I said, you know, I'm not John. Uh, as far as the emotional part is, he said, I know that. I know that. He said, but I hired you to win. Uh, and I worked for John for seven years as his assistant. His assistant. So I know all the good parts about John. and. Uh, 
and it was helpful to me as a head coach. And uh, so that was a uh, that was my my uh, my feeling there. As far as the first part of your question was uh, the first of uh, what was that the first part of the question? Oh, the, the first Mexican American quarterback in the NFL. Oh yeah. Well, you know, it wasn't in, it wasn't as it wasn't as big a thing when I first started. Uh, I never thought about it. Um, I don't think I never felt I was hired because of my ethnic background. I was hired because of what I could do on the field as a player and as a coach. And uh, I still feel that way. I mean, if, you know, first of all, if, you, if you're, it doesn't matter what color you are, you gotta be ready to be, to perform and you gotta be able to win. Otherwise you're gonna be unemployed, whatever color you are. <laughs> and and, I'm, and uh, fortunately I, I, was, uh, I was lucky enough to, uh, and worthy enough and good enough, I guess, to, to win uh, enough and establish myself and now here i am there you go thank you very much and look forward to seeing you in a couple weeks thank you all right ed and then and uh, after ed will be levi edwards hey coach it's ed granny from the review journal in las vegas um we talked to charles woodson yesterday about kind of his definition of a raider he always points to the alumni and the veterans that helped him out beyond kind of the commitment to excellence and everything we've always heard what was your definition as a Raider and what do you think they, they stood for when you were there? Well, I thought we were, yeah, the Raider, we were, first of all, we were a pretty tight family. Uh, and I say family because uh, that's what we were like. The, the old, the old core, uh, uh, the, the Raider nation is a family, a very powerful family because we, uh, we believe in each other and, and uh, we like the, uh, we like to be the underdogs. We like the the uh, honorness look that we have. It looks like Halloween every every Sunday afternoon when we play in, in Oakland. Uh, we like that. And that was uh, that was our our. It, it kind of little by little became our our way of life, and little by little, uh, wherever we went in this country, there they were. The Raider Nation was there, so we were very proud of that part. In fact, I I remember driving on a bus once pulling up to a stadium and here they are the Raider Nation uh, and uh, I, I looked around the bus at some of these guys that they just some of the young ones especially and the look in their eye was 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 worth it because they just said wow here we are and you know all the way to the other side of the country and look at this and uh, they were pretty uh, enamored by that and, and um, I thought it was great it was it was a great thing to have thank you coach you're welcome. Levi Edwards and then John Shearer, you're next. Tom, Levi Edwards with Raiders.com. Of course, over your two Super Bowl wins as a head coach, uh, looking back over your Hall of Fame career, would you say that the first one in uh, 80 was more difficult or would you say that the one in 84 with everything that was going on with the move to Los Angeles, which one do you kind of look at and say this was a lot harder to achieve or do you put them on the same playing level? Well, no, they were they were different. Uh, the eighty one was uh, was tough because we were we were kind of in a, in a uh, rebuilding mode. Uh, we had traded away Kenny Stabler. Uh, we had uh, a lot of veteran players, and not a lot of young players. Uh, we had uh, we traded for Kenny King. He was uh, one of our young running backs, uh, but uh, Upshaw and Shell had. Uh, one more good year to give us it. And we had, uh, we picked up guys like Bobby Chandler, Berger Stones, and Cedric Hardman. And they, they were veterans that had a year or two left in their tank and they gave it to us. They got, we were, we struggled, we struggled and we struggled all the way through. And then towards the end of the year, I started feeling pretty good about ourselves because we said, Hey, we're pretty, we're playing, playing well. We had some ups and downs but so did everybody else. And we resurrected Jim Plunkett. He came through like a champ for us, made big plays and big games. I thought that was that was a lot tougher than 80, 83 season uh, in, in uh, Los Angeles. The only thing that, about that was that uh, I lived in a hotel for 14 months uh, and that was tough. That was tough on me and my family. My family was up north and I was in, in Los Angeles and. It was uh, it was not a good uh, 
atmosphere. But uh, we persevered, and uh, we had we had a good team though that that we were pretty pretty loaded as far as good players. Thanks, Coach. Uh, John Shear and then Ray Lee. Hello, Mr. Flores. Uh, it's an absolute honor, first of all, to get to talk to you. Uh, congratulations on the Hall of Fame. Thank you. So do you think the current state of the Raiders, do you think they have an opportunity to go to a Super Bowl and win a Super Bowl? And have you talked to Coach Gruden and kind of given him any advice on coaching, um, seeing as he's struggled a little bit since he's gotten back into the NFL. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I think yeah, I certainly feel that they're they uh, they have a chance to to get to the end uh, to get to the Super Bowl, but they got they got to prove it. They've got they work hard. They're working hard. They've got some good talent. They've got us. Uh, my feeling is they've got to stay unified. And uh, there's been so many changes: offensive coordinator changes, head coaching changes, uh, player changes. You can't, and you do too many changes, it's not good for your team. It's not good for your continuity. And, uh, you know, John certainly knows how to win. He won before and been there before. He's been in that, that, that atmosphere. So it's not, that's not nothing new. It's just a matter of, of getting it done. And, um, yeah, I think they could do it. Uh, what other play, what better place than Las Vegas for the Raiders? Because they kind of fit, fit the mode of, of the city, the city knows that they can support a championship team to have it done so with a, with the a hockey team. Uh, so you know, I'm looking forward to it. And it, it, it's just, um, you know, the old saying, uh, every, every team in America right now, every NFL team in America is dreaming the same dream. And that's the Super Bowl. And uh, why not? Thank you, sir. You bet. Ray Lee and then Phil Jones. Hi, Mr. Flores. Hi. Ray Lee here with KDWN 101.5 FM, 7.20 AM, the talk of Las Vegas. First off, I wanted to congratulate you on being inducted into the Pro Football Hall of Fame. It's such a, Of course, it's such an honor to get to speak with you today as I have great respect for you. Um, my question for you is, in taking a walk down memory lane, I can only imagine the memories and hardships that you overcame as a pro footballer, assistant coach, and head coach. If you got the chance to revisit any of those memories, what would they be and why? Well, yeah, there's so many memories. Uh, uh, I, I remember our very first day in, ever in the history of the Raiders in Santa Cruz, California. There were 11 quarterbacks in training camp. 11. We couldn't even all get in one picture. And uh, now 61 years later, you, you look back and say, wow, look what we've done in, in that time. Look how many ups and how many fun times we've had, how many down times we've had, but we've always persevered. Look what this crazy game has grown to. Uh, look at what the Raiders have grown to. And uh, it, it's hard to imagine when, you, in, in, uh, when I saw the new stadium, uh, in Vegas, your beautiful stadium. Uh, I said, I must have said, wow, a hundred times. Wow, <laughs> wow, wow. Every time I turn around, I said, oh, look at that. We had a little Quonset hut that we practiced in. We had a field that was sinking on one side that, that if a player ran it down and out, he ran out of sight because the field was so lopsided. So all the things that have happened have happened for the good and uh, it's a great sport and the people enjoy it and uh, gotta keep doing it. Go Raiders. Go Raiders. Thank you, love it and congrats again. You bet. Phil Jones, then Chris Daly. Good afternoon, coach, how you doing? Hey Phil, I'm doing good, you? Hey, it's an honor to be sitting here speaking with you. Ah. Uh, two questions, so one, if you could probably take us back to that first Super Bowl that you won, what went through your mind? And with everything that's been circling around the Raiders' current quarterback, Derek Carr, with the whole, is he good enough? Why is it trade talks, this and that? What would you say to him 
to make sure he stays focused this year and he can help lead that Vegas Raider team to a playoff? Well, the first thing uh, to Derek is, uh, is that Derek, Derek's a very uh, positive thinking guy. I mean, he's uh, team oriented. He's worked, he's been under, uh, I, I really feel that he has had uh, so many downs, so many ups and downs in his short career because um, of all the different changes uh, and uh, coordinators and head coaches. This is the first time in his career that he's had the, the same type of system any length of time. I think that will help, especially if the offensive line uh, gets back to its uh, prominence that they need to be. To, you know, you can't do it alone as a quarterback. You need that offensive line. And uh, he certainly is a competitive enough. And I think if you can get him to the fourth quarter, he knows how he can win in the fourth quarter. It's in between there that, that, that uh, sometimes he's had issues. So I, th I think there's, I don't think there's any question that he can win. Whether he can win the big one, I'll tell you, I don't know. I tell you, think that's a, that is, uh, you never know. I mean, we didn't, we didn't know what we had when we had that, when we brought Jim Pluckett back and, and he had already been around the league for over 10 years. So, and he was able to, to deliver two, two, two Super Bowls for us. So a lot of times, uh, Kurt Warner, do you think, look at his career and how, where he came from and working in a grocery store or something, and all of a sudden there he is. Um, but, uh, you know, it's just, uh, I don't think there's any question. I think that, that Derek Carr has a physical ability. I can't tell you about the rest of it because I'm not around him every day. As far as my feelings on the field, I tell you, there's a lot of things, memories that go through your mind when you're on the field and, and the, the game is almost over and you're, you realize you're a world champion. And they go back all the way to back to your childhood, all the way back to high school. Some of the craziest things in the world go through your mind. And, but you all of a sudden, you, you feel this warm glow and you realize we're world champs. We did it. And, uh, and it wasn't I did it. We did it. We did it. So it's, it's a great feeling. And I hope we have it again. Well, congratulations, Coach. Thank you. Thank you. You bet. Chris Daly, then Alex Fleming. Hey, Coach. Congratulations on being inducted into the Hall of Fame. And to stay on topic with that 1980 season when you led the Raiders to a Super Bowl win over the Philadelphia Eagles, being the first wild card team to ever win a Super Bowl, just what set that team apart from all your other teams? Because you, you touched base about how it was a really old team, a lot of guys that you were unsure about. So what set that team apart? Well, we had uh, we had a lot of grit. Uh, that team, there was a, there was a lot of scars and, and scabs on, on everybody's bodies and minds because we had all bounced around a little bit, and we've been at the we've been at the the, uh, the bottom of the pile and, and resurrected ourselves. And and uh, it was my second year as a head coach, and and uh, we were struggling. We were struggling very hard. But I, I went. I knew I, I had. To, we had to do something. Uh, Mr. Al Davis knew that he was not very happy, and uh, you had to know him when he wasn't very happy. That wasn't a good feeling. <laughs> so, uh, but I said, you know, we can't. We're not doing anything wrong. Um, we're uh, the worst thing you can do when you, when things are going badly is change everything because you're not geared to change everything. You got to do what you believe in, what your players believe in. And so we just have to do it better. And we had to practice better and concentrate and get rid of the rest of So we kind of went into our own shell and uh, just did what we had to do. And little by little, we won and we won here and won there and won there. And all of a sudden, we're in the playoffs. And once you get in the playoffs, I, used to, I always told players, once you're in the playoffs, anything can happen. Anything. And anything happened that year. And uh, we were able to win as a wild card, as the extra game on the road, and uh, did it with style and class and dignity. Thanks, Coach. Uh, Alex Fleming and then uh, Rick Watson. Coach Flores, first and foremost, congratulations on being inducted to the Hall of Fame. 
it is an absolute honor to get to speak with you. You laid the foundation for so many minority and future head coaches in the NFL. And for that, we're indebted to you. So thank you. I guess my question is, you were a player, an assistant coach, and a head coach. When did you know that you were a leader of men? Well, I never, I always felt that I, I uh, always felt that I knew what I was doing and I knew it and I could uh, always try to do it well. And I, well, I always had friends and uh, I always seemed to be leading the pack here, even a little in the high school, junior high, um, college. Uh, it was just one of those things where you, you know, the, the dust settles, there you are, you're, you're, they're following you, but they, the, uh, but you have to be, be able to perform once you get to the top. But I never dreamed that I was going to be, uh, where I was as far as the head coach of a world championship team. But once I got into the business, once I got in, into coaching, I said, if I'm going to do this, I've got to do it well, I've got to do the best I can. And I'm not going to be happy being an assistant coach. I've got to go for the gold. And uh, it worked out. It worked out pretty good. Uh, ended up winning a few games. <laughs> Congratulations. Where are, you Where are you driving to anyway? Where are you going? <laughs> I'm, I'm just heading from work. I wasn't going to miss this. You don't oh, get to good. talk to a Hall of Famer like you all the time. Well, I'm glad you did. I'm glad you did. Enjoy your day. Thanks, Alex. Uh, up next is uh, Rick and then Rafael. Hey, good afternoon, Coach. Rick Watson with Big Dog Sports Talk. Congratulations, first of all, on uh, being inducted into the Hall of Fame. Um, my question is, you know, coming up in the AFL uh, all those years as a player and an assistant and then into the NFL, how much more special were those head-to-head -head wins that you had against the NFC going back to the identity that the AFL had created for itself against the then NFL? It was great. I tell you, it was I, – I have been – fighting that battle ever since I was in the <laughs> AFL. And I'm an AFL guy. There's, really, there's only 20 of us that made it uh, through the entire existence of the AFL, 20 guys uh, that made it for 10 years. And I'm proud to be one of them. And I always felt, I said, hey, we need our due. What, where's our little Hall of Fame? We should, we should be acknowledged at the Hall of Fame. Uh, we were responsible. Uh, along with television, for the change in football because we were innovative, uh, we were wild and crazy guys, and <laughs> we became the Raiders, uh, wild and crazy Raiders. But also, we opened up the game. the uh, The NFL was was very solid and very stoic and tougher than nails. So we got the toughness didn't go away, but but the flamboyance uh, came in, and which made it more entertaining than that. The passing and the trickery and all that stuff, uh, it became, uh, we brought it into, into vogue and, uh, and it's still going strong. Thanks, Coach. Congrats again. You bet. Thank you. Rafael, you're up and uh, Jake will be next. Hey, Coach. This is Rafael with the Three Point Conversion. Man, it's a pleasure to be able to talk to you and uh, congrats on getting inducted in the Hall of Fame in August. So, my question is, you talked about the contrast earlier between you and uh, Coach Madden as far as personalities. With all of the different types of personalities and characters with the Raiders, when you took over as head coach, why do you think that worked as far as you being very calm versus the different personalities? And then did you change anything or did you allow them to still be who they were? I didn't change anything. Um, we still were the Raiders. We still treated the players the same way. Uh, I had been there for seven years under John. And uh, so the players, actually, it was an advantage to me because they knew me. They knew my demeanor. They knew what kind of a coach I was, assistant coach, and, and uh, subsequently um, the head coach. And, uh, so that was not new. And... Uh, we didn't take away any of the privileges they had. And I was, uh, I wasn't a wild and crazy player, um, but I was, uh, I let them be what they wanted to be within reason, <laughs> because within reason is about as far as you can let them go. 
Um, so I didn't change. Uh, we still did a lot of the same things, the same little uh, um, idiosyncrasies that, that uh, the Raiders had all those years, the same character of builders. That was, that was the Raiders. They never changed. And a quick follow-up, who was the biggest – character or um, had the biggest personality when you were there as far as the players? Oh, my, there was no problem. Ted Hendricks was one. Uh, he was such a dominating defensive player. He was, he was always getting, he, he would get bored and he always pulled some kind of a trick during training camp or somewhere along the way. Uh, he was a character. Uh, we had a guy way back when John Matuzak was a little, a little quirky at times. Um, Everybody had a had their own way of doing things, and uh, it was fun to see because we allowed it to a certain extreme. We allowed it to happen. Let them have fun. The game should be fun. Thank you. Thanks, Raphael. Thanks, Coach. Uh, Jake, you're up, and then Quentin. Hey, Coach. Uh, first and foremost, congratulations on uh, your Hall of Fame induction. Well, thank you. Thanks. Uh, yeah, you were a coach for a long time, whether it was an assistant coach, you know, wide receivers coach or head coach. You coached a lot of players in all your years. And I know it's hard to kind of pick one. You started to talk about just with the last question, who had the biggest personalities, but who was your favorite player to coach? And if you don't have one, you can give me a couple. If it's, I, I know it's really, I know it's hard to pick one. If you have a couple that come to mind, feel free to just give me those. Well, uh, I have a couple that come, come to mind. Uh, Jim Pluckett, obviously, we what because we had a lot of common, being, having the same ethic background, um, battling come back uh, um, and, uh, really, you know, achieving what we did. Um, he was always one of my, he was one of my favorites before we even got him. Um, I mentioned Ted Hendricks, uh, Cliff Branch. Uh, was one of the one of the he was the first wide receiver that I coached when I came back into the, the Raiders as assistant coach. Uh, uh, Marcus Allen, classy, great player. Um, Mike Haynes. Uh, I could go on and on, but the, those are some of the some of the guys that uh, Matt Millen. They were just good players, uh, good leaders. Tough guys and, and great uh, role models. Quentin, you're up, and uh, VJ next. Hey, Coach, how you doing? It's an honor to talk to you. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, well, you were the first minority head coach to win a Super Bowl title. Do you think – head coaching opportunities as well as front office opportunities have gotten better for minorities or do you think it's still the same and can be approved upon? Well, not everything can always be approved, uh, improved, I mean. Uh, and uh, I think it has improved, but obviously not enough. Uh, uh, you just have to continue to, to do what you do. And, and uh I think the uh, some of the programs that they've instilled in the National Football League are helping the minorities as far as elevate to different positions of leadership uh, other than just assistant coaches. There are a lot of assistant coaches that are minorities in the, in the game right now, but where, where the issues are is, is in general managers and, and obviously ownership at some point. But the general managers and, and the leadership there, head coaches, um, patience, um, but it doesn't happen overnight. It just doesn't. Also, I had a follow-up question. Now, everyone's been talking about the 1980 Super Bowl title. I have a question about one particular game. What were your memories from that 1980 AFC Divisional game against the Browns? Cold. It was cold. <laughs> It was 39 below chill factor. Oh my God. I mean, it was, I never missed so a cold in my life. Um, you know, we were, I had so many clothes on. If I had fallen out, I couldn't have gotten back up. But our guys coming from California, we, we uh, weathered the storm uh, right there at, the, at the, the edge of Lake Erie. And it was, even though it was cold, 39 below, as I said, uh, it didn't affect our guys. They played well. We we uh, we did some of the we kicked off instead of uh, received at halftime because I didn't want to be going what 
one direction because of the icy field. And all those things uh, worked out for us. And we're, we had we were halfway back to California that night after the game by the time that I thawed out. But it was cold. All right. Thank you, Coach, and congratulations again. You bet. Yeah, three words live in Cleveland sports lore after that game. Red, right, 88, and we, yeah. we don't like, <laughs> we don't like the rest of the uh, we got three, qu <laughs> three questions left, Coach. Uh, we'll go to VJ and then Aaron. Uh, thank you very much. First of all, uh, Ms. Flores, congratulations on your Pro Football Hall of Fame induction, sir. Thank you. Um, I live in Los Angeles. My wife and all my in-laws are diehard Raider fans. You are truly a hero to a lot of the my older in-laws. They talk about you all the time. Uh, I, I just want to uh, just dig into your brain a little bit more about the AFL because I always found it so intriguing uh, that the AFL and the NFL merger and Al Davis and how he has such a big uh, part of that. Could you just speak to just the pride of the AFL? And, and if it hadn't have been a money thing, do you think the AFL could eventually had have competed against the NFL and those teams at the time and beat some of those teams and maybe beat them in some of the Super Bowls head to head? Well, I think we did. We showed that at the end of the uh, 10 years by winning the last two Super Bowls. Uh, you know, the, uh, the Chiefs, I was with the Chiefs on Super Bowl IV. I was a backup quarterback to Lenny Dawson uh, after the, the uh, Jets had won. So uh, we proved that, that equality in the top teams had gotten pretty good. It had gotten, uh, was, was close to being there. Not as an entire league was there, but it was in the top teams. And it was going to grow. Uh, the money factor was always uh, uh, an issue that uh, allowed us to grow. But as far as just football itself, we uh, we we had there was a lot of pride involved AFL. And then um, you you run into a guy from the American Football League, and he said, "You were in the NFL." I said, "No, I was in the AFL." Yeah. And uh, they'll say it with a smile and pride. And that's the way I feel. I was in the American Football League, a pioneer in the history of football that will never be equaled. Thank you so much. And as a man of multi-race, I'm Black and Hispanic. Thank you so much for opening the door for the Latinos and Hispanics in the National Football League. You will be cherished for forever. Congratulations once again on your induction, sir. Andale. Andale. <laughs> All right, Aaron and uh, Levi will close us out. Hey, Coach. In your time with the Raiders, who is a tougher quarterback to prepare for, Dan Fouts or John Elway? Oh, boy, that's a good question. I'll tell you, uh, Elway was the toughest because he was all over the field. Uh, Fouts was – we didn't – we couldn't let him have the ball because he when he was hot, he was hot. But he was a pocket guy. Elway could get, leave the pocket, and when he left the pocket, big things happened. He was such a powerful guy. Uh, I loved them both, and uh, they, were, they were in our division, so we saw them twice a year, whether we liked it or not. But uh, they, they, it, was fun. it was fun to play against the good guys. I, I, I love playing against the good, the good players because they elevate your play, and uh, you don't have to tell your players, see that guy over there? We can't let him do that. And, uh, but the Elway was uh, – but I would, I would have liked to have had either one. Thanks again and congrats. You bet. Levi, last question. It's all yours. Thank you. Uh, Coach Flores, once again, uh, with Raiders.com. Uh, in the previous question, I also forgot to congratulate you on your Hall of Fame career and much deserved. And going into that question with it, you know, the whole process of having to wait so long to actually get your induction. Was it one of those things where when it did finally happen, were you in awe or were you fully expecting it? Is this something that you are still like on cloud nine about or is this something that you feel has been a long time coming and you've been ready to be a Hall of Famer for a long time? Well, first of all, I was kind of expected it uh, sooner and it didn't happen. So then I got skeptical about it and, and uh, I was a little of, uh, guarded it as far as anticipating that this might be the year. So I wasn't going to, I wasn't going to count anything. And then when it did finally happen, when, when Mr. Baker knocked on my door here in my home in Palm Springs, and I saw that big body coming through the doorway, I said, Oh man, 
it had, uh, that's when you realize it's happened. And I tell you, there's no better feeling. I have tears of my eyes. Uh, uh, I have tears of my eyes right now just thinking about it because that's, that's as far as, that's a lifetime of achievement. And that's forever. And uh, my feeling is that when you make the Hall of Fame, you don't make the Hall of Fame. You and your family make the Hall of Fame and your friends and your coaches and your players. We all go in together. I just, I'm just a representative of a, of a wonderful group and a wonderful game. Thank you so much, Coach. You deserve you it. All right, see you. Levi, thanks for that question. It uh, teed it up nicely for Coach Flores to uh, introduce the idea of, of coming to Canton. And, and we are waiting for you, Coach. Three weeks from today will be the Hall of Fame game and, and your first appearance as a well-deserved member of the Pro Football Hall of Fame. And, and you will elevate the museum. And, and we are looking forward to that. So thank you, everybody, for a great session. You bet. Thank you.